Good evening. Um, I'm Alan Andres. I'm a member of the board of the Associates of the Boston Public Library. And I'm glad you can all join us this evening. This is the 18th time we've met to celebrate a new Associates of the Boston Public Library Writer in Residence Fellow. Once again, this year, the pandemic is keeping us from meeting in the, in the Boston Public Library's Abbey Room. But your presence tonight is still an essential part of the evening's program. And as we would at a live event at the BPL, you're welcome to, to ask, ask questions. Um, our authors will be responding to them at the conclusion of this program. There is a Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen on the right, and you can ask a question some anytime during the program if you want to submit it. Um, despite the pandemic, the Writer in Residence program itself has continued as actively as possible. And this year, we made a few significant developments. More on that in a couple of minutes. But first, a bit about the fellowship itself. Our fellowship remains unique in the world, honoring an emerging writer of literature for children and young adults with financial support and the use of a writer's room of one's own at the Boston Public Library. This year, we are increasing the annual grant to $23,000. And we've added an additional stipend to accommodate editorial support should our re recipients wish to avail themselves of such help. The fellowship itself was begun in 2004 as a way for the associates to not only continue its mission to support the BPL's unique special collections, but also to partner with the Boston Public Library in the creation of new work for new readers around the world. It defines the Boston Public Library as a place where books are not only found on its shelves, but where they are actively created by newly recognized writers. As of this date, more than 60 books have been published or are currently under contract by past recipients of the, of the Associates of the Boston Public Library's Writer in Residence Program. The books written at the library under the auspices of this program range from historical sagas and graphic novels to fantasies and crime thrillers. Many have won awards from booksellers and literary foundations, and two titles written at the BPL have even been sold to major American filmmaking studios. The coming year, we'll see the publication of new books by past writers and residents, such as Elaine Demopoulos's Turn the Tide, coming from Clarion Books, Annie Hartnett's Unlikely Animals from Random House, and Jennifer DeLeon's Maya from Simon & Schuster. I want to thank the board of the Associates of the Boston Public Library, the president of the library, David Leonard, and many who have generously volunteered to help read and judge the submissions each year. For more than a decade, our fellowship has been generously underwritten by an anonymous donor whose support has been essential. The donor's belief in this program has been the hidden story behind this fellowship, which has changed the lives of our writer and residents and their readers. For those who may be learning of the Associates of the Writer in Residence program for the first time, it's open to emerging writers of promise who have not already established a professional career. Since its inception, the fellowship has had a blind judging procedure in which the panel who selects the recipient is not given any biographical background. Their judgment is based primarily on the quality of the submission and the promise of the book to be written based on a brief writing sample and a proposal in which they describe the book they intend to write. As the writing, publishing, and teaching community can be fairly interconnected, we insist that if any of the judges suspect they know the identity of any, any of the applicants based on the work in the application, they will recuse themselves from the discussion. Each year, our judging panel is composed of a different assortment of professionals from the book world, acquisitions, editors, book critics, historians of children's literature, librarians, literary agents, publishing and marketing veterans, and noted authors. However, we did things somewhat differently this year. On the occasion of the Associates' own 50th anniversary, 
we decided to name two separate writer and residence recipients. One for a book of prose and a second for a writer illustrator. 10 years earlier, we also wanted a writer illustrator. So this is the second time we're doing that. This entailed two separate calls for entries and two separate judging panels. While this is a one-time experiment with two writers in one year, we may consider doing this again in another few years. And in a moment, you'll meet our two new writers and residents. However, as is customary every year, we will first celebrate our outgoing writer in residence, Autumn Allen, whose virtual residency was unfairly affected by the pandemic and was largely unable to access the writer's room at the BPL. Fortunately, she did get to use it, I can say, but only for a brief period. Nevertheless, she forged ahead working on her young adult novel titled All You Have to Do, a story of two generations of black middle-class family told in alternating narrative threads set in April 1968 and the fall of 1995. Here, I welcome Autumn Allen to tell us more about her novel from which she will read a brief excerpt. Autumn. Thank you so much, Alan. Good evening, everyone. Peace be upon you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's lovely to see all the familiar names in the chat. Um, I have had an amazing experience this year as the writer in residence. Even though I did miss out on having the office at the Copley Library for most of the year, I was able to continue working in my little corner at home. And in the spring, we moved to a house where I now have an office with a door, which is <laughs> really helpful for writing. And um, I have a view of cows on a pasture, so it's really ideal. So I'm counting my blessings and I'm also just gonna, you know, keep asking for an IOU from the associates. <laughs> um, I have had so much support this past year. Um, you know, it's amazing, you know, getting the support from the associates, but also everyone in my life. And so I just want to thank everyone who has been there to cheer me on and, and help me. Um, so after the anonymous donor who makes the residency possible, I'll start with my two special readers, Shonda and Heather. Shonda is my sister who read aloud my entire manuscript to me and Heather and just watching them react in real time was so valuable um, for my writing process. And it's something I will never forget. And if my manuscript never saw the light of day in the public and publishing, it would have been worth writing it just for that experience. So that was amazing. Thank you, Shonda. Um, I wanna thank my brother, Khalil, who generously shared his experiences with me and contributed lyrics um, to include in the manuscript and read the manuscript. And I waited with bated breath to see what he would think of it and he approved. So that was great. Um, my stepfather, Alvin, hosted me in my mom's studio as I started out with the residency when I was kind of like not knowing where to work because the office wasn't available. Um, and he's an artist himself, he's a musician. And so we were always there. He was available to talk about create, the creative life and how to you know, put your art first. Um, and I had other readers who helped me out a lot in my writing group, Women of Words, Kaija, Jenea, Michelle, Yesenia, and Kat and Chad Bright and Regine Jean Charles, um, who were um, friends from high school who were able to read my manuscript as well and give me feedback. Um, of course, I have to thank my wonderful agent, Tina Dubois, and my wonderful husband, Darren, not necessarily in that order, I'm not sure which order <laughs> I should have put that in, um, but I'd be hiding under the covers if it weren't for both of them. Um, and of course, uh, not uh, last but not least, I always thank the creator for sending all these opportunities and people and support my way. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what I learned about writing this year, um, because you know, the more you practice your craft, the more you learn about the process of writing, not only the process in general, but your own process. Um, so every stage of writing has its own unique joys and challenges. Um, looking back, I see that first drafts are not just the fear of the blank page, but also the freedom to just create whatever you know, whatever you want to create at that time, because it, it doesn't have to be seen by anyone else. Um, so next time I go into a first draft, I'm going to hopefully keep in mind that freedom rather than being sort of uh, anxious and fearful. Um, 
rewriting is something that can make your brain hurt. <laughs> um, it really is um, just a process of figuring out what you meant to say and where you have said some of it and then trying to, to boost that up. Um, revising is like putting a puzzle together. I think you can see the map on my wall behind me of all the post-it notes. Each post-it note is a scene and um, just trying to figure out what order they should go in and which need to just get cut and all of that. Um, and then editing and polishing, I'm almost there and I'm really hoping that that's gonna be the fun part. So if anyone doesn't think it is, just don't tell me that. <laughs> um, so I've been working on this manuscript for almost four years and I'm hoping that um, Everything I've learned as I've written throughout those four years will show up in the quality of the final draft. Um, I started out the residency last fall planning to work on the architecture of my novel as I revised. And I got through a very strong revision. I sent it out for feedback and I got an abundance of feedback and my head was spinning and it took me a while to distill all the feedback into actionable revision steps. But I've been using those revision steps and working through it and I can see the end is near. Um, so one of my main lessons that I've learned this past year, which I'm still navigating, is how to write for your reader and accommodate your reader. Um, because I write in order to clarify things for myself. And so, um, you know, there, with this novel, there came a point where I was satisfied with um, how it was because I had answered my questions and I, you know, I felt like it was the story that I needed to write. Um, but when you share your writing, it has to be a gift for others. And so um, at this point, I'm sort of trying to look at it from the reader's perspective and prioritizing the reader's experience. And my challenge right now is trying to figure out how much I'm willing to change, why and for whom. Um, so I'm going to read for you the opening pages of my manuscript. All you have to do uh, follows two young black men in, in historically white schools in separate eras in alternating narrative threads. So in April 1968, after the assassination of Dr. King, Kevin becomes involved in a student protest at Columbia. And in 1995, amidst controversy over the Million Men March, Gibran and his friends challenged the culture of their pr private prep school in Massachusetts. So I'm just going to read the opening scene of the novel, which is from the perspective of Gibran. The bass is thumping. I can feel it in my bones. It's begging me to bob my head, grin, and shout. In another place, I would get up, my boys in step with me, rush the stage, dance. But in Thatcher Hall, at Lakeside Academy, I freeze. Am I shaking? Three boys take the stage, and I go deaf, too busy taking in every detail of their appearance to let the music flow into my ears. The bass becomes a confused, muffled noise as my eyes travel every inch of their bodies. The first thing I notice are the shoes, six different shoes, six pairs of sneakers all mixed up on three pairs of feet, yellow with red, red with green, green with black, high top sneakers, good ones, expensive ones, the extras discarded. Did they each buy two pairs of sneakers, all for this one night, this one stunt, all on their parents' credit cards, maybe sending their nannies to the mall for them, making them complicit in this? I watch them pace back and forth across the stage pretending to warm up to the music, acting like they're going to rhyme. I keep watching those sneakers. I know they will never wear them again. They wear baggy jeans, two blue, one black. So baggy, I know they wouldn't be allowed to wear them except as a joke. The jeans are also new, still creased and saturated with dye. Crisp white t-shirts, extra, extra large. The jeans, the shirts, they will never wear these again either. Thick gold chains, at least those have to be fake. And baseball caps, they overlook this detail. They've tucked their hair, straight mouse brown strands and blonde curls into faded Red Sox caps. Gear a real artist would never wear in public, much less perform in. The contrast is almost funny. But there are the shoes and the walk, an exaggerated pimp walk, dip hop, dip hop, arms swinging. They march across the stage, a greedy grin on their faces, swaying to a rhythm that doesn't match the bass still rattling my bones. Mics held to their thin lips, their mouths start to move, but I can't hear the words. I can barely hear the muffled laughter of the other white students who look on. I tear my eyes away from the stage and check the audience. The boys' friends are cracking up, 
shouting, cheering them on. Other white students cover their smiles with one hand as if they aren't sure they should find this funny. The boys on stage are laughing. Their blue, green, hazel eyes gleam with something that looks sinister to me. They wear a confidence that was never taken from them. I want to steal it now. I can't sit here and witness this, but what can I do? Stop the show, bash the speakers, slap the microphones out of their hands? I savor the fantasy, but there are too many witnesses. To be the aggressor in front of the whole school, that would guarantee my expulsion. I wouldn't mind, it could be worth it, if only it weren't for my mother's tears, my family's pleas. You're almost there, Gibran, just graduate, just finish your last year, like it's easy. No, the longer I'm here, the harder it gets. I look at James on my right. His dark eyes are narrowed, squinting as they follow the boys across the stage. His black eyebrows practically meet like he's trying to figure out if this is for real. Our eyes meet. David, brown eyes rolled toward the ceiling, hands folded on top of his head like he's holding himself together. He finds our eyes too. We exchange thoughts this way for a minute. Here we go. These dudes, are they serious right now? I look around at the other black students. The boys who just got here this year look surprised and confused. I shake my head remembering my first year. The black sophomores, the juniors, and all of the girls stare at the stage, at the floor, some at the wall, like they're determined not to be provoked. A handful of brown and black faces and bodies contorted in shapes of discomfort, disbelief, and disgust. They wear it lightly though, not wanting to cause a scene or put their emotions on display here. They just wait, wait for it to be over. We are all just sitting here suffering, taking it, and none of these white people, students or faculty, are noticing. I can't do it anymore. I get up. I'm just thinking I'll go outside, get some air, wait till this insult is over, and come back. It's not much. It's barely a protest, but it's something. At least I can liberate myself. I get up, and I walk toward the auditorium door, and then I see it. The electrical cord from the speaker to the outlet runs right by the door to the hallway, connected by an extension cord. It's an old building, several hundred years old, like most of the buildings at this school, whose prestige comes from its age and its pedigree. The cord catches my eye like a snake on a trail. I pause mid-stride. My eyes travel the length of the wire. People accuse me of doing things without thinking. The thing is though, I'm always thinking. I just calculate differently from them. I think one thing, right or wrong. Is it right for me to let everyone else sit here subjected to this nonsense while I go get some air? No. Is it right for me to stop this show if I can do it without damaging any property or injuring any bodies? Hell yeah. So I continue out the door, but as I go, I bend down and yank the cord out of the wall. The music stops. The roaring in my ears stops. My back feels lighter and my chest opens up. I can breathe better. Maybe I just saved my life. There is a sweet moment of silence before the reactions begin. So that's where I'll stop <laughs> and to read more, see my published book in a few years. <laughs> Thank you, Autumn. That was uh, quite powerful. Um, and now, as is customary, I will now welcome Boston Public Library's President David Leonard to accept Autumn Allen's manuscript, which will join the work of past authors from the Writer in Residence program and become part of the Boston Public Library's permanent collection. David? Uh, thank you so much, Alan, and uh, congratulations, Autumn, on, on reaching this major milestone. Uh, I missed the very beginning of the opening of the program tonight for technical reasons, so I apologize for that. But I'm not sure if everybody knows, but the residents in this program, uh, we get to be neighbors. Uh, different offices have been used at different times in the McKim building but we get to be neighbors uh, during the writing process. And maybe that wasn't quite as possible during, during COVID, but we're returning, returning to that model. Um, I think it's, it's important to uh, recognize um, you know, this ceremony of your contributions being added to those who came before you and they become part of the, um, uh, part of the works that are held by the Boston Public Library. And I'll offer a few, a few comments in a moment to that, but we've now practiced this virtual handoff. If we were physically together in person, um, we would obviously be, be ha you'd be handing it to me, but we're, we're going to do this virtual, uh, virtual handoff if you're ready. I'm ready. All right. 
Um, yeah. And Autumn, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And we look forward to uh, hearing and reading much more of it uh, in its published form, uh, hopefully in due course. So I, I hope this has been a great year for you with this work, um, despite all of the challenges we all continue to face and encounter. And I, I now want to, um, Alan, if I may, just um, offer a few uh, comments on, on why this is so important. Uh, first of all, congratulations again, not just to Autumn, but to you, Alan, and the associates and the couple of very special donors who make this possible. Uh, this is an important part of our work together. And while the majority of the focus of the associates work is on preserving and conserving the rare books, manuscripts and other historical objects in the collection. We, we all recognize that we are on a continuum, a continuum that must continue to today, uh, where the books being created in the library, with the library, through the library, become that historical record that gets passed to another generation um, in years to come. Um, I want to borrow uh, from one of the speakers at the Roxbury branch opening on Saturday. Um, she quoted Isaac Asimov in what the library has to um, offer us. And so I'm going to borrow that, if I may, uh, from one, one writer and author to another. Uh, this is uh, remarks made at the opening of the Troy, Michigan Public Library in 1971. Congratulations on the new library, because it isn't just a library. It is a spaceship that will take you to the farthest reaches of the universe, a time machine that will take you to the far past and the far future a teacher that knows more than any human being, a friend that will amuse you and console you, and most of all, a gateway to a better and happier and more useful life. And so I think it's important to share that not just the library, but the books within it and the works and books being created provide gateways to the imagination for the readers to come, uh, readers today, whether it's insightfulness about the past, insightfulness about our current present, or hopes for the future. And so this is the work that we are all engaged in together. Um, writers such as Autumn, um, supporters such as the associates and the staff and the benefactors of the public library. So together we form this community that hopes for a better world. So once again, Alan, congratulations to you and the associates. Autumn, congratulations to you. And um, now I think it's going to be congratulations to our incoming residents. So Alan, back to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, David, or should I say, Captain David of the Starship Boston <laughs> Public Library. Um, this year's um, Fellowship for a Work of Prose goes to Ying Zhulai, whose proposed young adult novel titled Going to Disneyland is a coming of age story centered on 16, a 16 year old whose parents are wanted by the Chinese government for fraud and bribery. Yingzhu grew up in Taipei before moving to New England where she majored in psychology at Westland and studied creative writing at BU. Her work has appeared in Plowshares and Literary Help. One of our judges said of her proposal, it feels like a wholly original story that should appeal to a vast number of teens with varying tastes. Perhaps most importantly, though, it's downright fun. Please join me in welcoming Ying Zhulai. Thank you, Alan. Um, I want to thank the Associates of Boston Public Library for this amazing opportunity you know, it is really a privilege to have a room of my own at the library, especially after the past year, when all of it, all of us struggled to, to find personal spaces, um, you know, while working from home or taking care of our families. Um, on that note, I also want to thank my family and uh, my teachers and colleagues at Boston University. And lastly, thank you, Kathleen, 
um, Louisa and Laura of the Associates of Boston Public Library for organizing this event, um, coordinating all the details of the fellowship program, and you know, making me and Katie feel so welcome at the library. Um, so I started thinking about my novel going to Disneyland about five, six years ago um, when I was just out of graduate school. Um, at the time, I had a part-time job um, where I coached Chinese high school students um, to write college application essays. So those were kids from very wealthy Chinese families who went to boarding schools in um, either the States or the UK, and they were applying to American schools. Um, and there's this, this, this stereotype about um, wealthy children from China or, or wealthy children everywhere, really. Um, they are they are you know spoiled and lazy they spend money recklessly they are you know they don't have goals in life you know it, the kids i met um you know were kind of confirmed that stereotype in a way but there were also just so much more you know most of them left home when they were 13 14 and by the time i met them as seniors in high school you know a lot of them still talk about being lonely or they talk about not fitting in um, with their American classmates. Um, the main character in my novel, Jia Jia Liu, you know, she could have been a student I tutored back then. You know, in the first chapter, she finds out that her parents have lost their fortune, her mother has disappeared um, in China, as people sometimes do, um, and her father, had, father has escaped to the US and showed up at her boarding school. Um, not to give any give away some you know any part of the plots, but um, but I think you know my character I think Jia Jia is going to be fine, and I think all the students I tutor would be fine as well, you know. And at some point in their lives, they're going to they're going to to find out what they care about, and they're going to find out what their goals are, you know. Because I think for kids like that, you know, having experienced loneliness at such a young age and having to be independent. Um, really, you know, like they have to develop some kind of resilience and they have to develop depth in their characters. So this novel, I think for me, this novel is my way to understand the teenagers behind, um, you know, the money and the material things um, and the social media. And because I have faith in my character, I have faith in, um, I have faith in, in, in the students I, I taught. You know, I think they're all going to be fine and I want to figure out how they will survive spiritually. I want to find out how they will thrive. Um, so now I'm going to read a short excerpt from um, an early chapter in the novel. Here we learn a little bit more about Jia Jia's life in China before she came to the US and we get a sense of the kind of upbringing she had. Long before Jia Jia's parents became rich with real money, they had mastered the art of appearing rich. Act as if you fly first class, they like to say, and you would start to think like people who fly first class. More important, you would build connections with people who had access to exclusive lounges at the airport and received complimentary champagne on the plane. Once those people thought you were also rich, they would give you opportunities to make money because they assume you would do the same for them. For many years, Jia Jia and her parents lived in the smallest apartment in the tallest, shiniest building in Changsha, a city of 7 million in South Central China. Their living room was filled with things. It bulged with two rooms worth of furniture and three rooms worth of clothes, shoes, and bags that spilled out from her mother's closet. Most of those were fake designer goods, but they weren't ordinary fake Chanel jackets, Louis Vuitton bags and Prada shoes. The people who made them were some of the most skilled craftsmen in China, her mother said. And they only sold the counterfeit goods to respectable people. The fact that Jia Jia's mother was allowed to buy them was a sign of her status. It proved how well connected she was. Whenever she bought a new Chanel bag or a new Versace skirt, she and Jia Jia would compare them with pictures of the real things. They would agree that the fake bag and skirt and shoes look better than the real ones. The brass buckles on the bag were shinier, the logos bigger, and the stiletto's red soles looked redder. 
Jia Jiang's mother was a real estate agent. She took calls from her clients day and night, whispering sweet promises of south-facing windows, auspicious feng shui, nationally ranked school district, and happiness and love that would be the natural products of those perfect houses. Jia Jiang's father sold stainless steel window security bars to homeowners. He convinced people to buy his products by issuing warnings about gang activities, drug addicts, thieves, rapists, murderers, and the unspeakable dangers they must guard themselves against. Next to money, connection was the most important thing in life, Jia Jia's parents said. Connecting with the real people, with people, meant they felt obliged to do favors for you, especially the kind they were not supposed to give. You could connect pe with people by getting them to like you, but you could achieve the same results by making them afraid of you or jealous of you. If they thought they needed you, they might do things for you. It didn't matter if, if whether they really needed you or whether they had reasons to be afraid of you or if they truly liked you. You just have to make them think so. Once in a while, Jia Jia wondered, what if those people who were supposed to be rich were also pretending to be rich? What if their Chanel bags were also fake? What if those people who bragged about sunbathing in Hawaii in winter and skiing in New Zealand in summer actually spent their vacations sitting at home and watching movies on a small laptop, just like Jia Jia and her parents did? If everyone was pretending to be rich in the hope that the others would give them the opportunity to make money, and yet no one had the money to share or the opportunity to give. Where was the real money? Jia Jia need not have worried. Eventually, her parents became rich in appearance and in reality. They bought a condo that cost 4 million renminbi. It had six rooms and two walk-in closets for her mother's clothes and shoes, which were now filled with real Chanel's and real Louis Vuitton's. Jia Jia enrolled in a school that cost 90,000 renminbi per year in tuition, which did not include four sets of uniforms. The uniforms were designed by Ralph Lauren himself and cost 2,500 renminbi each. Then her parents bought more and more properties, not just in Chang Changsha, but Shanghai and Hong Kong and LA, and Jia Jia was sent to an even more expensive school, Mary Claremont Academy in Sheffield, Massachusetts. It was one of the most expensive schools in the world. It cost even more than Harvard, her father liked to say. On that gray, foggy day, when Jia Jia's father showed up at her school and announced he was taking her to Disneyland, she was annoyed by his loud voice, by how out of place he and his ill-fitted Armani suit looked in the headmistress's office. But having money meant you could make last minute plans and you could afford to be obnoxious and ungraceful. Then they arrived at the parking lot and she saw her father open the door of a dusty old Toyota Corolla, its interior covered in cracked fake leather. At that moment, Jia Jia knew that something must be really, really wrong. So that was Jia Jia Liu and the world she grew up in. She eventually, she and her father will travel to California um, in that old Toyota Corolla and she will discover more things about her parents and herself. Um, just so excited to work on this novel this year and I hope that next year at this time I'll be able to report on my progress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jinju. Um... I will look forward to it a year from now when I hope you're reading from the finished manuscript. Um, uh, and with her will also be our second writer in residence for this year. And as I said earlier, this year for the first time we're awarding an additional separate writer in residence fellowship for a writer illustrator. Over the years, the proposal for books combining words and image got short shrift when judged alongside works of prose. Convinced that we should allow such proposals to compete on a level playing field, a decade ago, we solicited applications exclusively for projects to be executed by writer illustrators. It was long overdue that we, that we do this again. So for this year, 
we set up an additional writer in residence, a writer illustrator residency fellowship. Our recipient, Katie Doughty, has has proposed a nonfiction, non young adult graphic novel format book titled A Handful of Stories from the End of the World. In a series of small vignettes, the book will take the reader on a humorous yet reflective journey that considers an extinction level event by weaving together the thoughts that keep biologists, engineers, geologists, theologians, and astronomers up late at night when pondering the end of everything. An illustrator currently living in Somerville, Katie earned an MF, a B, BFA at uh, an illustration from the Rhode Island School of Design and is currently working as a designer and media coordinator at Children's Hospital. She's also a master's of public health candidate at BU. One of our judges praised Katie's skill at combining graphic information clearly and thoughtfully while simultaneously doing so in a fun and creative manner. Quote, her very topical nonfiction project about the end of the human species is a fascinating combination of science and wonder, your judge said. I can't wait to see the results. Please join me in welcoming Katie Doughty to tell us more about her book project. Thank you so much, Alan. I'm honored that the Associates of the Boston Public Library has afforded me what's truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. And thanks also for the encouragement of my family, friends, and loved ones who constantly offer support. It makes me very happy to see your names on the Zoom today. Uh, the seeds of my proposed graphic novel, A Handful of Stories from the End of the World, began in March 2020. You can probably guess why. Uh, the first Saturday after Massachusetts announced its first lockdown, I cozied up on my couch with a book I'd been meaning to finish reading called A Short History of Nearly Everything. I'd just gotten to a section that paints a really vivid picture of asteroid impacts on Earth, and I didn't make it that much farther on the book that Saturday. But thinking about asteroids raining down on me while sheltering from a pandemic, I'm sure I wasn't the only one who felt like it was the end of the world. I think young audiences think about this too, and that's where my graphic novel will come in. I think looking at the world, the end of the world with curiosity and empathy makes it possible to be existential without being bleak. This fellowship will give me the resources to bring this idea to life. Financial support and the time it affords is the most precious resource, but the fellowship will go further than that. The BPL's extensive uh, books, book collection uh, will be, and, and already have been, uh, invaluable for research for nonfiction. And uh, the support of uh, the, the BPL community, and especially uh, not being the only uh, writer in residence uh, will be really wonderful as well. So without too much further ado, uh, I'm going to share my screen and do a little comic read along uh, from an excerpt from the introduction section of my book. Imagine you're an early European. One day, strangers arrive. They look like you, maybe a little taller, a little more lithe, and it seems to you a little more fragile. You could probably take them in a fight. They don't seem that special, except that they talk a lot more than you. Maybe that's why they all seem so close, and there sure are a lot of them. From here, you can fill in the story with whatever details you like. We don't really know how it all went down, so go ahead and make it epic. This is a clash of species after all. Throw in some star-crossed lovers if you want, since there's Neanderthal DNA in many humans. 
Just be sure it ends like this. The strangers live and your kind does not. This is the end of your people. Humans have been the cause of many species extinctions, like the stellar sea cow, the quagga, and the Bachman's warbler. One of these days, the tables are bound to turn, but extinction of the human species seems both totally predictable and nearly impossible. On the one hand, we'd be in good company if we were extinct. 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever lived just aren't around anymore, like gut bacteria, sigillaria, and ankylosaurus. We haven't stood any test of time, at least not compared to the real evolutionary experts like lice, horseshoe crabs, or crocodilians. On the other hand, we've bounced back from demographic disasters that might have seemed at the time to be the end of the world. The Ice Age, the Bronze Age collapse, and the Black Death. We can communicate with each other with clarity and complexity, even across thousands of years. We can work together to get ourselves in places no other species has managed. And it only takes a handful of members to keep the species going. The lowest the population has ever been was about 75,000 years ago, when there were only 10,000 people on Earth. That's about the number who would fit in a block like you see. But geneticists estimate that we could bounce back from a group of only 1,000. If you plan it right, 98 is enough to keep a space crew going for 6,300 years to Proxima Centauri, and 70 people settled the entirety of prehistoric North America. Thanks so much for reading along with my comic, and hopefully, uh, if you tune in a year later, I'll have more to show you. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Uh, I. You did, probably didn't see this when you were working your screens, but there was one little chat thing that came up and said, this is so cool, <laughs> which is kind of nice to see. That's one thing we don't get in the, in the live audience because everybody holds, holds their mouth. Anyway, it's um, now my pleasure to introduce the Associates Communications and Development Associate, Kathleen Pendleton, who's been gathering your questions submitted during the program and who she will field them to our honorees. So Kathleen. Hi, everybody. If you, anyone has any questions, please feel free to add them to the, the uh, Q&A box down below. Uh, we'd love to, to hear them. I can ask a question to get us started. Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> um, so Katie, I'm wondering if you write the script first and then start drawing, or do you sketch and write at the same time? Or how does that work? That is a great question. Uh, I the short answer is I write the script first and then draw, but it's impossible to not write a script without starting to envision the panel a little bit. So I uh, typically, the, the writing process involves thinking of a little bit of a panel structure for the first go around. And then the second go around is starting to lay out what text is going to go where. There's lots of, lots of iterations of combining the interplay between word and text. So I think we, we have a question that came in um, and it's for all the writers. So we'll start with uh, Yingju. Uh, where do you get your motivation? Um, it's, um, it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult, especially I have a young child at home and just with everything going on. Um, it's, um, and you know, as, um, 
as you may know that I, I received my, my MFA degree um, almost 10 years ago and I haven't really written substantially. Um, where do I get my motivation? I think it's because I, you know, I, I care about my characters. I care about the people I've met and um, I'm curious about them. So I, so even as, even, even as like, there's so much going on in life, um, I still want to understand them. I still want to figure things out. And as Aldom said earlier, um, you know, your first draft, you're writing for yourself and you're answering some questions for yourself. And I think I'm still at that stage. Um, and the more I write, the more curious I become of my character of people like her and um, the more questions I have for myself. And, um, and so essentially it's really all, all um, inside me. Thank you. Autumn, how about you? It's actually very similar. It's curiosity. Um, I actually had um, a chimney sweep over <laughs> the other day to clean my chimney. And I just sat there watching him and asking questions. And he said, you seem really curious. <laughs> And I was like, well, yeah, I guess I am. I am just a curious person and I am always wondering how things work. And, you know, if I, you know, know someone who acts in a way that I would never act, it, you know, I, I think about it until I can somehow conceive of how it's possible. Um, and so uh, the motivation for me to write is to get the thought, the thinking out of my brain and onto paper so that it can make some sense to me and not just drive me crazy. Because in my mind, it'll just ruminate over and over and over and go in circles. So. Um, Katie, we have a question for you. Um, the graphic novel is a much misunderstood genre. The words are so few. How do you ensure that they encapsulate so much meaning in the right and at the right vocabulary level? I wish I had an easy answer because I spend a lot of time, a lot of time thinking about that exact same question. Uh, one little test that I have, that I often use to make sure I'm taking full advantage of the format is I will separate, I will read just the script and take the, take the words out of the page. And if they are telling the exact same story, it's, not a great page. Uh, I think the whole of each page should be greater than the sum of its parts uh, in that the, they're either telling a complementary story, the, the words and images are telling a complementary story or perhaps adding extra detail. I make for, for uh, nonfiction, I make a lot of use of labels uh, to kind of give a lot of different examples. Um, but it's, it's tough to get, I, I think often in writing rather than in illustrating. So I do a lot of paring down the script and, uh, force myself to make the images do a lot, carry a lot of the weight as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and I have another question for everybody. Um, that's, I think, a fun one. Um, can the panelists say something about what they won't have to do, crappy jobs, et cetera, because of winning this award? And maybe start with Autumn, since she's had that experience already um, with getting the, the prize money. Sure. I don't want to call any of the jobs I was doing crappy. I love them all. <laughs> But um, I've spent the past few years um, reviewing children's books, and I love doing that. I love getting a sneak preview of, you know, what's coming out soon and, um, you know, exercising that part of my brain that analyzes what's working and what's not, because as a writer, it helps me. Um, however, it pays very little, as any of you who, <laughs> who review books know. Um, so I, I did have to step back from my load uh, for how many books I could review in a like a month um, time period, just the flow of books that was coming to me. So um, it, was, it was more a matter of sort of scaling back all of the little side jobs that I was doing. And I guess I sent one of my children to school. <laughs> that helped. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, 
Actually, I have a question for Ying Du. Um, they're wondering, could you talk about the research for your novel, particularly the fashion elements? The fashion elements. Well, there, I don't really need to do that much research. You know, I grew up. I grew up in Taiwan, and I grew up reading the tabloids. I, um, you know, I've always been fascinated by the lives of. Um, of the rich and the famous. So that I don't need to do much research. Um, um, as, for, as for the other parts, you know, like for me, a big part of, you know, like for me, this is both a Chinese novel and, and an American novel. And, you know, being a Taiwanese person, I'm actually, you know, both feels rather foreign to me. So um, I do a lot of research. Um, I, I read up, um, I read a lot about um, China, about, um, um, especially government corruption and you know business scandals in the past 20 years and a lot of the research about China is really you know it's really happening in real time I feel like every other day you you read about a, a, an important businessman or um, a celebrity just dis disappear um, because of some because of as collateral damage of some power struggle um, and they come back and under the public eye they always they, you know they always make this grand proclamation about wanting to devote the rest of their life to, to advance the interest of the country, of the fatherland, of the party. Um, so a lot of that, so a lot of, um, you know, like things that's happening in China just feels really relevant to me. And, um, and at the same time, um, in my novel, the father and daughter, they go on a road trip um, across the US. So um, this is also a, I've been living in the US for, over 20 years and I actually recently became an American citizen, but um, I actually don't know that much about American history. I don't know that much about the US, you know, what, what the people are like, what the culture is like between um, the West and the East Coast, you know, what's in between. I, I don't really have, I don't really know very well. So I'm also reading up on that, on, um, you know, the, 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 the fracking culture in, in, in North Dakota, I'm reading about um, cults in the, in America. So it it's just really exciting for me. For it's almost as if you know, as my character is learning about herself, learning about the U.S. I'm also learning with her in a way. That's great. Thank you, um, Katie. What are some things that uh, you want your young audience to glean from your novel, and how are you hoping to impact them? especially with such an interesting topic as the end of the world is? Um, I'm hoping to not, I'm hoping to respect their curiosity. I mean, around that age, I definitely gravitated toward, you know, learning about science in general, but also thinking about big questions. Uh, so I hope to kind of follow at least where young Katie was uh, as kind of a young adult. Um, I hope to use playfulness uh, and a lot of kind of fun facts to uh, appeal toward that endless need for knowledge that someone who would like a book like this would go in there for. Um, and also I, all of these end of world scenarios have, um, I, I don't know if silver lining is the exact right word, but there's all behind every, um, behind every discovery about something scary is an earnest scientist and behind every, um, every scary scenario is some kind of revelation about the nature of, why we are here. Um, honestly, this was a this is a a big and scary topic and one piece of media that uh, I look to when thinking, can you do this in a nice way is if anyone has seen the good place, the the tears that I had for the finale of the good place, uh, I think uh, there's a there's a kind of um, there's a kind of peace that and perspective that comes from looking at things that are so big and scary that I think uh, young, especially as young audiences, think, the big thing I'm thinking of for a young audience that scares a lot of young people and everyone 
is uh, climate change and a lot of the um, the geared toward young people materials that I've see are a little bit too don't worry about it. This is fixable, but I think respecting both the fears and the curiosity and lending uh, giving the opportunity to have a broader perspective are things that I'm hoping to offer with this novel. That's great. As somebody said in the chat, I think these scenarios bring hope as well. So they do. And a lot of one historical thing is a lot of these in the world scenarios are not new. They have happened before and people came out uh, doing okay. Yes, we're not the Ankylosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, um, and this is for Autumn. Um, so someone says, after listening to all of you and other writers I know, I always wonder, how do you get to a place to know when you are done? And since you've just finished your work, how did you know when you felt like this is a good stopping spot? This is where I'm done. Well, you're never done. <laughs> I was done in April, but I don't know if Tina is still here. She did not agree with me. That's my agent. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you may feel that you're done. You may feel that you accomplished what you needed to accomplish, but um, other people then come into the process to, you know, if you're trying to publish, they help you to see what is going to be seen from the other side, from someone who hasn't worked on this piece for four years and someone who, you know, um, is just gonna pick it up, read the first page and decide whether to continue or not. So um, it's, it's you, you decide when you are satisfied and when you think that you can't make it any better, um, someone else has to. And so um, my agent is still trying to convince me that I can make it better. And I'm not sure I believe her, but we'll see. <laughs> Thanks. And I think that's great advice for Katie and Yingju as well. So thank you for that. Um, Alan, back to you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And so this concludes our program. We did it actually just a little over an hour. Um, that, congratulations to all our honorees and all our past writers and residents. We look forward to seeing everyone next year and in person. If you want to learn more about this program and the mission of the Associates of the Boston Public Library, an independent nonprofit, please go to our website, associatesbpl.org. That's one word, associatesbpl.org. And with that, I wish you all a good evening and thank you for coming.